Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Not Mistbusters talk. Uh, <laughs> so, that's the only applause we're getting. The only applause. <laughs> so, everybody, go ahead, look around, pat people on the back. We are not sheep. We. <laughs> so, just don't ask why we all have signatures on our badges. <laughs> so. We are here today, of course, to talk about some new tools that we've added to the Samurai project. Uh, we are the, the Samurai developers. We do have some other people in the audience that are part of the team. Um, but we have two new tools here that we want to talk to you about today that are, that are great, great tools. If I show of hands, how many people in the audience have actually used one of the Samurai versions we've come out with in the last year? Excellent. Um, everybody knows that this is the one year anniversary for Samurai. We officially released it last year at DEF CON. No, no. Well, During. we DEF released Con. it <laughs> in Jackson, Florida. Jacksonville. Jacksonville, excuse me. Um, because we had one member of our team that happened to be the brainchild behind the project that uh, wasn't able to attend DEF CON. So we were kind enough to send him a whole bunch of SMS messages and tell him what to add as he was sitting there crying in his office. <laughs> so anyway, so here's our team. Okay, so we have Kevin Johnson. He, once again, is the, the brainchild behind the project. Um, we are all of his slaves. No, we, uh, <laughs> we just make him do all the work and we uh, take all the credit. So, Kevin Johnson, if you don't know who Kevin Johnson is, he is the leader of the base project, for those that have used Snort. Um, also, the project that he is working on is Samurai, Laudanum, Yokoso, as well as several other ones that uh, we don't have time to go through in the talk. Yeah. Um, he is a penetration tester for In Guardians, um, as is myself, and we have Frank DiMaggio. He is also working on these projects with us. He is project lead for the Laudanum project, and he is a researcher of web application security issues. And so once again, we have Kevin, Frank, and myself, Justin Searle, and we will hand it over to Frank. So you have injection flaws, obviously. Everybody loves injection flaws. Um, attackers, pen testers, we live for injection flaws, some of us, some of us not. Um, and we love those applications that trust the user. Trust Why? is fun. <laughs> trust is good. I thought greed was good, but trust is good, too. Trust us. Because <laughs> we don't trust you. Uh, with those flaws, you have the different categories. You have the SQL injection, you have the cross-site scripting, you have the um, CSRF, you have, of course, command injection. Kevin this morning said there's 12. I don't believe him. <laughs> I made that up. <laughs> it's the question. It's not the answer. Everybody should recognize that statement there. That's the query. It doesn't matter what it is as long as it's true because we're looking for a response that's coming back from that. One's, greater than, uh, one's less than two. Uh, one is one. It's the trueness of it. Pony and, equals and, and why is that 42? It's the question. If you don't know the 42 reference, just get up and leave now. <laughs> so Come of course on, that, guys, bring your towel. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, leads us to the injectable exploits. Injectable exploits, of course, fun. One of the same, right? Uh, there's many different attacks uh, that can happen. SQL injection, probably the most uh, popular. Probably the most popular. Um, it can do many different attacks. Yeah, please. Yeah, um, we've got all the different vulnerabilities, right? We have, Frank just ran through some of them, the CSS, uh, CSRF or XSRF, if you want to go that route. Um, but within each of those vulnerabilities, you've got multiple exploits that you can accomplish, right? We, for example, with SQL injection, we can start retrieving records, the one that scares lots of people. But let's go even worse. Let's really be evil and start changing transactions. Executing commands, which, by the way, is not a Microsoft-only problem, even though, well, we like to pick on Microsoft for it, XP Command Shell. Who thought that was a good idea? You, I mean, come on. I, I, sometimes you've got to look at these applications and wonder if the people that architect them, design them, and develop them are smoking crack. <laughs> it's just my, I, maybe I'm judgmental. Okay, no maybe. But it's, they're just nuts. Hey, let's build a database that's supposed to store records and then give people the ability to write to files, execute commands, uh, and port scan internal networks. Don't you ever want your databases to write those files to a... <laughs> It's as if they, they're following the Emacs development model. Let's, let's build an operating system and call it an editor. 
which leads us to laudanum. <laughs> so Kevin brought up the idea of naming this thing laudanum, and I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? What's actually, laudanum? Actually, there was a gentleman named Nick who came up with the name. So I heard the name, and I had to go to Wikipedia and find out what in the heck is this thing? Well, it's, you know, it's also known as an alone. opium tincture, tincture of opium. What the hell is a tincture? So I'm looking through this, I'm like, wait a minute. If somebody would please update Wikipedia with the proper response, that'd be great. The question will be, will be, by the end of the talk, will somebody have edited Wikipedia to mention the project? Of course, they'll then remove it. <laughs> Worth a try. Yeah. So there's methods of uh, injecting the files. So you, if you have access to the server, well, web dev, right? Uh, FTP, uh, service exploitation. Uh, of course, uh, there's a uh, file include vulnerability, and of course, our favorite, SQL injection. Yeah, we, we've got all of these different ways to inject files. I mean, Justin and I do this on a regular basis. Uh, when we're doing penetration tests, we find these servers that people put out there. They expose services, they expose applications. Heck, how many times have you come across an FTP server that has anonymous enabled and can write to the file system? Raise your hand if you're running that server. <laughs> ah, I see, I caught you. <laughs> Right? Justin? <laughs> yeah, tag. Right? Oh, so. Okay, okay, okay. I had agreed, agreed to cover this slide. So, <laughs> when we were talking about SQL injection, which for laudanum, which we're going to get to in a second, with laudanum, any of these methods to inject files can be used to inject the laudanum scripts. But we're partial to SQL injection. Mm -hmm kind of because it, well, it scares people. Well, the people that understand what it is. You talk to somebody who understands, you say, hey, your app is vulnerable to SQL injection. And, and you, you like chills, right? Uh. And, and we have to admit that uh, it, it's, it's the one word that uh, all the people in the companies actually know when we're talking about web applications. If, if you say anything else, you have a vulnerability here, there, and they're kind of like, oh, OK. Yeah. Tell me what I do need to fix it. You see my SQL, or SQL injection there. Yeah, there, their eyes start uh, watering. Yeah. So with SQL, now remember, at this point, what we're talking about is not the attack. We're talking about features built in to the query language, which again brings back the smoking crack idea. So we've got the ability within our queries to take the record set and write it to a file. You know, simple example here, select star from some table into, well, some file. This can write anywhere the database has permissions to. Now, let's be very careful there when we say permissions. We're talking about, one, file system permissions, but we're also talking about permission within the configuration. For example, uh, modern versions of MySQL have configurations that limit down to if it can write to files at all or where it can write to files. But then we have our vendors. How many people here love vendors? Come on, guys, they make our jobs easier, <laughs> right? Vend I love vendors. They come in, they do their dog and pony show, we get to tear their applications apart. You know, it's kind of fun. But vendors build these appliances, one U boxes that are designed to let me own your network. <laughs> now, of course, that's not in the marketing materials. Their salespeople tell you, no, no, it's safe. We'll manage it for you. You don't have to touch it. Don't patch our box. It's ours. Ever. Ever. <laughs> yeah. These guys, they build these appliances, and most, well, okay, maybe not most anymore, or maybe, they configure these things so insecurely, I can't tell you the number of one new pizza boxes running MySQL as root with no restrictions as to where it can write the files. Why? Because the vendor's help desk somewhere in the world, I'm swearing we're going to start outsourcing to Mars. It is the plan for the moon mission, right? To move help desks up to the moon. But they want to be able to support these systems as simply as possible. And if we have those security restrictions, right? They're so inconvenient. We've got our problem. What do we have to do? Well, you got to go. You have to know root's password and run sudo and do this and do, oh, no. Let's just run it as root. That way, when we have the problem, we can write it. So in this case, right, we can write to anywhere this install of MySQL has. I don't know about you guys, but I immediately start thinking of? Bitemp directory? 
var dub 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 or no well you could if you yeah, want yeah, yeah. i would personally yeah, yeah. so <laughs> i don't know i personally run with my web server so i can access my whole file system it's nice. a lot funner that way nice so once we start talking about writing files, now let's start talking about another, and I hope you hear the quotes, feature of SQL. So what is that feature? <laughs> yeah, controlling the output. Oh, you mean that I can actually tell the database to, uh, to, to, to take this output or take this string that I pass to it and just echo it back to me, right? Kind of like the echo command since that was such a great idea in the first place. Yeah, it we is. have printf in SQL. It is trusting, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is trusting. <laughs> Right? So we've got the ability to do something like select injectable files are cool from table. Now, that table has to exist. So you have to know the table. I don't know, sys objects. And, and it's just going to search for that string inside that table, right? That's the whole purpose for this, no, this command. No, 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 no. It doesn't search. It looks like we actually get people say to us all the time, well, you forgot the where. It's like, no, there is no where there. That's the field. We're asking for or the you, column. Or the column. Okay, okay, yeah. You got to do the semantic game, right? Because us nerds, we come up with multiple words and acronyms to mean the same things. You know why we do that? We were picked on in high school. They now need to ask us what it means. It's lots of fun that way, right? Oh, I guess I'm revealing too much. So we can actually, we can actually set the record set that comes back from our query to anything we want, which brings us milk and cookies. <laughs> Let's combine these two ideas. Let's take the ability to control the record set that comes back. Take the ability to write that record set to the file system anywhere we want. So you, you're telling me you want me to go ahead and tell the database to echo back the string hello world with HTML tags around it and drop that to a file inside the web root. So that way, when I surf to that file name or that, that URL, I will then see the wonderful message, hello world, right? I, I wouldn't go hello world. I would oh, okay. just say PHP info parentheses parentheses semicolon. <laughs> My first guess. Or, or exec, <laughs> right? So we've got this. Let's go to the next one, and, and Justin, take it from here. <laughs> so we have our wonderful project called Laudanum. What Laudanum is is a set of different exploit payloads that we can use in SQL injection or any other type of injection we can. If you need to have some type of file that can be used by a web browser to give you some type of functionality or feature, we now have a set of tools or set of payloads that we can use for that very purpose. So, exploit scripts designed for injection. This is the main purpose. Some of the things that we have currently right now in Yucoso, excuse me, whoa, Wait, we're wrong there. project. Yep, you know, know, the other project. First wrong project and one slide ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. It says multiple functions right there. Well, it does, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have, we have uh, Laudanum written. Our payloads are currently written in multiple different languages. Because once again, when you are attacking a web server, you never know what type of language you're going to be encountering. So the idea here is let's go ahead and have several different types of functions, such as um, shells, web-based shells. And we're going to write these web-based shells across every single language that we can possibly think of, or we get bored in our time and decide to go and write. Um, in <laughs> We're never bored. What are you never talking bored. about? <laughs> bored hackers are dangerous. <laughs> hey, you, you don't want bored hackers on your network. I guess we should leave off the word bored. <laughs> Maybe. Just, just keep in mind, though, one thing that we, we didn't put on the slide. Uh, when we say that these are injectable payloads, keep in mind that with SQL injection, you're injecting around, in a lot of cases, a text field, which in the query has been quoted. So as we've built these injectable scripts, we've been very, very careful to keep consistency across and using single quotes or double quotes so that when you pick the file to inject, you're not escaping out of your injection point too early. Right? So we've tried to keep this in mind as we're building forward. You know, and this basically is, is based on our need as we're doing pen tests. 
we run into these situations all the time and we've had to create them. Now we've decided to turn around and hand them back out to other people and, well, ask for help, right? So let's start talking about the, the different shells we've got. One thing we need work. to point out, though, is the, the idea of uh, base uh, 64 encoding to get past the IDS. Yeah, no, no, don't slip. Don't slip. We're not done. Yeah. Yeah, so with, with the shells, we've got shell access. But to remember, we've got different types of shell access. This is not about. a terminal session. This yes. is not Telnet. This is not SSH. This is we have a nice little web-based form. We tell it a command to run. And it will run that command and echo the response back out to us. So this sadly, is... no VI. Exactly. So <laughs> sad day in the world. <laughs> okay, no Emacs either. Sorry, Kevin. So with these interactive shells, we can do all sorts of, of very creative things, like uh, "Hello World," right? <laughs> no. <You're> obsessed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, he, we need to get him a T-shirt that says "Hello World." Does anybody know where we can get one? No. <laughs> so we've got the ability within these scripts to do base64 encoding of the output of the commands. The idea there is the script is going to run the command. Base64 of the output, send it down to the browser. The browser, us, has JavaScript running in it to un-base64 encode, maybe base64 decode, so that we can see it in our client, but the IDSs we're blowing by aren't decoding that traffic. So they're not going to trigger things like the snort attack responses rules and things like that. We're bypassing IDSs. We're bypassing the monitoring, right? We also have a whole bunch of other scripts in development to do things like DNS query, Active Directory response, uh, pulling back LDAP information. Because what we re recall, we're writing this out to a database on the back end system. Now this database may be running on the web server in the DMZ, maybe on an internal system, whatever, but that system in most cases is an internal application and so it has internal trust. You know, how many times have you found where outside we can't do DNS zone transfers any longer? But inside machines can. So if we write to a file, run that through a web interface, we're able to pull back all of your zone information. Or we're able to pull back your internal zone information if you're doing split DNS. And we're grabbing information, pulling all of this in from your internal servers. Now, we are looking for help with these scripts, right? This is an open source project, GPL. We're looking for people to jump on board and help writing stuff. So. And, and once again, these concepts are not new. What yes. we're trying to bring here is we're trying to bring all these concepts have, that, have, that have been done, all the, the scripts that have been done, trying to introduce some new minor features and have them in one single location so we can actually access them and update them very easily. And of course, uh, being that we're trying to be responsible, you have to have some scope limitations. Responsible. Uh, important for pen testers, not so important for... Uh, evil attackers, uh, don't know any of those. Uh, so obviously we're going to have some built-in features for that to be protective. Uh, you want to allow uh, control to the access, so we're going to restrict the IP, uh, authentication, okay, and uh, which, which, some of these, which some of these are, are features in the, current, in the current payloads out there right now rarely implement. They rarely have abilities to be able to control what IP addresses are accessing these tools. So if you upload a shell, they're not checking to see where the source IP address is coming from or some other type of authentication mechanism. If we are doing penetration testing for clients, it's a bit important to stay within inside of our scope. So we need to have these features inside of our tools. And, we, and we, we please, we love all the tools that you guys are writing. Please, as you're writing your own tools, if whether they're part of your laudanum or not, let's add these features in them because right. they are useful. There are some purposes for them. Now, the one unique thing that we've seen, and, and you know, I'm not saying that nobody else has done it, I've just not found it, one of the features we've got is when you try to access these files, if you fail whatever access control check we do, we don't just give you an error. We actually return a 404 page not found message. And the idea there is that in simple scanning, you're not going to be able to find this file sitting on the server. Yes, there are ways to fingerprint the 404 messages and determine that it's not one sent by the actual server that was being sent by my script. But in simple scanning, you're not going to see these files. The reason we do that is not because we're worried about people accessing the files. That's what the access control is built in for. 
What we're worried about is if I inject, we're going to do questions at the end. Talking to the mic. Okay, I'm sorry, man. So what we're going to do is, that's better? Okay, I thought I was. So what we're talking about is when we put these files up on the server, this simple person coming by with like Nikto or something like that to find these scripts running on the server, they're not going to see them because they don't have access to them. But if they were able to see that the file existed, but they didn't have access, well, what does that tell you? It tells you the application is vulnerable to some form of injection. What are you going to do? Start looking for it, right? So because we don't want to weaken the security, because we don't want to open people up, we're actually returning a 404 status code. So our second uh, project that we are working on, or uh, releasing today, Yokoso. XSS is actually my favorite vulnerability, right? Cross-site scripting. I love running stuff in your browser. Hope you don't mind. It's 2009, and I'm still being told by really smart people, and people that, well, up until this question I respected, what's the big deal? It's, it's a pop-up, right? I hacked myself. Ah, an alert box, right? Yeah, or, or, or what's good hacking the users? You know, you have to you have to attack each individual user. <laughs> what's what's good? You're you're attacking our users. You're not attacking our infrastructure. Not what to mention the fact that the users the user? have access to your infrastructure. <laughs> what can it's, we find from that user? What information is available on their browser? Not much. I, I've always liked the idea. You're not attacking me. You're attacking my user. So that's it's okay if you have a storefront for me to come into your store and just kick every single person that comes in in the knee. <laughs> I'm not attacking you. It's just. Well, your customers. I don't know about you, but if I walked into a store and somebody kicked me, we won't discuss what would happen then, but I'm going to be pissed at the store. What are you doing letting them sit there do that? Well, it's just a user. No big deal, right? And client languages, you know, we used to laugh at people when they said they were a JavaScript programmer, right? I actually saw a guy had it on his resume. We just threw the resume away. No, we're talking years ago. He was like, JavaScript programmer? Next, you're going to tell me you're an HTML programmer, right? <laughs> but nowadays, JavaScript, wow, I, I'm embarrassed to say. Well, OK, right? It, the language has functionality that is incredible, what we're adding to it. And that, you know, as Sean Moyer and Nathan Hamil said this morning, you know, the feature set that the browsers are adding is just astronomical Target in that. fail. Let's, let's add the ability to do this. Let's add the ability to do this, as we'll talk about on Sunday, zombieing browsers, right? Let's take control, hand the control of your browser, well, my browser now, back to the attacker using JavaScript. All client-side code can do what we want. So enter Yokoso. The idea of in November of uh, 2007, Japan decided to fingerprint everybody who comes into the country. Um, you're welcome, or welcome to our country. Here you are, we're now we know you. And, and of course, this is after millions and millions of dollars spent over the last five, six, seven years with the Yokoso project. You know, welcome to our country. If you ever go to Tokyo, you'll see all these Yokoso signs all over the place. And uh, yeah, w what better way to welcome you is uh, be able to track exactly who you are and be able to say hello and greet you by name. <laughs> that's, our that's our wrong purpose. there. <laughs> So, Yokoso, this is not a tool. This, we want to bring that up right up front. Yokoso is a set of fingerprints, okay? Fingerprints of URLs. Now, the, when, when Just says it's not a tool, he's right. It is a collection of fingerprints, but the idea is both with Yokoso, we're including tools and it can be used within other tools. You know, doing things like delivery of these fingerprints via XSS, uh, mapping out internal networks or external applica applications. You know, one of the things we like the idea about, let's take these fingerprints, reformat them, and shove them out into Nikto or something like that, right? So we can definitely use them with Nikto on the outside, but our primary purpose at this moment and the list that we currently have inside of our fingerprints are focusing on the inside. Okay, we're focusing more on infrastructure web management. Today, in our, in our businesses, we have these systems, these black boxes, or these other types of services coming in, and the way that we administer all of them now is web-based interfaces. Please do me a favor. If you can't manage a firewall, Unless you have a web interface, stop managing firewalls. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I saw a guy walking around yesterday, not to pick on one guy. Um, <laughs> watch, he's going to stand up and storm out. But I saw a guy walking around yesterday. He had a Webman shirt on. And, now, I, I'm not judging that man. Maybe he knows how to manage his web server and he doesn't need a web interface. But I'm just not sure I'd want to advertise to, you know, what is it, eight, ten thousand 10,000 hacksaws? That his server at home probably has webmin and he probably doesn't know how to manage it any other way. Right? It's the way it works nowadays. Let's give you a web interface. You can build it. You can manage it. We, we can stop paying people lots of money to do cool IT stuff. Oh, and secure our stuff. So we have a set of fingerprints to help us identify these systems inside of our network. Any of these systems such as firewalls, you, you name it. Just a whole bunch of different systems. With No. Um, these systems that are used for administration purposes. The way we do this is by identifying unique URLs, either by unique images that the website is pulling up or unique pages that each individual um, user is accessing on the page. Whatever we can find to uniquely identify this, stuff, the, this application that is not common across the whole board. Now, as part of this, some applications, the majority nowadays, have authentication. At part least according to their salespeople. Well, yeah. You know, it's passwords, it's all about the passwords. So we have authentication. We have fingerprints for these applications for pre-authentication and post-authentication. So that way, with the pre-authentication, we can simply identify what's inside of the network. If we're doing this via cross-site scripting, we can use uh, browser-based history attacks to look through and, and see if those systems exist. If we have some other type of tool inside the network, we can then use that tool to once again query something like Durbuster on the inside to query those URLs to try to identify which ones of those administration systems are there. We have a second set of fingerprints that identify post-authentication. So once a user has logged in, what unique pages, what unique elements, what unique images are being seen? So that way, not only can we identify what systems are inside the network, we can also identify who the administrators are, or at least the users. Hopefully, we want the administrators. Yeah, the idea is if you've been to that page, you have access to it, right? You had to get past that authentication form. At least we assume you had to get past it that you don't know a vulnerability we're not sure of, right? So we've got lots of different uses for these fingerprints within XSS attacks. We can do, as Justin was just saying, we can do infrastructure discovery. We can actually find the critical devices. Now, one of the nice ways to do this is, you know, shove down some JavaScript that simply makes requests, does a host sweep of the internal network finding them. You guys have all seen that code, right? Then after we find all of the hosts, then let's run through the OCOSO fingerprint list and determine if that host has any of the files that we know represent web-based administration. So if it's there, well, if you found an ILO board, I'm going to guess you've got an ILO board. I now have identified it. We then can flip the coin and start looking at history browsing. The idea, you know, it's been talked about many times. Let's see if this browser right here has been to this page. If you have, well, who are you? If you've been to the web administration console for a database server, you're probably a database admin. Now, depending on who my target is, I don't know about you guys, but database admins are some of my favorite targets. Oh, you, right? mean, you mean running with domain admin on the database, right? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. Because yeah, you need domain admin to run on a database. But they have access to all the data. And what is data? Fun. <laughs> right? I know, I know. It's money, too. <laughs> And once again, these, this fingerprint concept's not new. We have lots of tools out there. We have Nessus. We have Qualys. We have a whole bunch of other one, um, tools. Nick2 has some in there to identify some of these systems. Once again, we don't have a single location to group all these fingerprints together. We don't have any of these fingerprints that really are focusing on some of the additional types of attacks that we can do with the history browsing attacks, where we're actually checking for pulse authentication if they've visited the site or not. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to look for interesting devices. Frank was just talking to me yesterday about an interesting device that's rolling out in certain networks out there. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't add it, but uh, have anybody seen the power strips that you plug in to the network? How, how wonderfully smart of an idea that is. IP addressable. I mean, how many data centers do you aware of that they divide up the machines to production and dev into separate racks? Not many. They're all mix and match. So you could take control and denial of servers. Right there. Why do you need a web server 
on a, on a power strip. Or your fridge. Or your washer. My or coffee your machine. Dryer. Sorry, spending too much time on the smart grid security stuff. My wife actually likes the idea of a refrigerator that surfs the internet. Yeah, it works really well. Trust me. I know. So obviously some other items uh, that you're looking at. We've already mentioned um, HP ILO. All right, that's console control of the server right there. Same thing with the Dell DRAC. IBM has their version. Uh, it, obviously remote management, we understand that, but they don't lock that down very well. Uh, other things, IP-based KVMs. Avacent, HP, IBM. All the popular brands, they love them, they use them. All your, all your web interfaces for your, your software, your devices, your CSAs, your PIXs, whatever. All of those devices, web interfaces, we can find them. Right. Then at that point, we start identifying who you are. We can widen our attack. We, well, one, we can find out if you're in scope. How many of you have done a pen test where you're only allowed to go after IT people? Because the non-IT people, well, we've already given up on them securing their systems. <laughs> hey, don't, don't pen test them. We'll lose. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to lose anyways. But we can identify if you're in scope. Not only can we identify you're in scope, you can identify if you have the information we want. We can identify who you are. Once we figure that out, now we start doing some fun tricks. We've identified what infrastructure you had in the previous slide. Now, because we understand the infrastructure, we probably know of different vulnerabilities, CSERF vulnerabilities in this infrastructure. We've identified you're an admin. Oh, and you did that cool save my password feature. Let's give up the idea of people remembering passwords, have our browsers, because nothing has ever been wrong with a browser, Internet Explorer. But that protects you from typing it in. It does protect you. No, Keyloggers can't them. grab yeah. it. You know, one of the things we're asking for is we need more fingerprints. We've collected a number of them. We're building every, every day. We're releasing new things. But we're asking for people to provide fingerprints to us. Now, there's a couple ways to do it. The simplest way, if you're lazy, is to go to the page, say view source, and copy the resources and send them over to us. A better way for us is for you to use something, uh, uh, an interception proxy. You, you can use your choice. We prefer Burp and Web Scarab because we've built parser tools for them. But you, go, you surf to the site. You browse out to the administrative features. Then you save that interception proxy log. Now, please remove any private data. I've already had people send me captures from Web Scarab that included their username and password logging into it, right? I was very much tempted to include the username and password in the fingerprint file in Ucoso. I didn't. I was nice. Now, don't just delete it, right? Because that placeholder, that, that password, was something that was important. So please in, insert some type of placeholder. Something as simple as the word password goes here. I guess that'd be a sentence, right? <laughs> Send us the results of that. And do us one favor. Tell us what the heck we're looking at. Don't just send us fingerprints and say, these are really cool devices I looked at and you might be interested in. Tell us what they're called, what version number, if you can get that. Any information you can give us is better than no information. So send that over. And once again, just real fast, let me, as you think about it, there's a list. These are some of the things we're thinking about. If you even have other ideas of major categories that we may have not mentioned, please Skater. pass it our way so that way we can add it to our list. We can start thinking about these things as well. And that leads us to the final piece, Samurai. Samurai Web Testing Framework. Once again, one year anniversary URL for those that have not been there. Here are a few of the tools that we have on the Samurai CD. So the Samurai is a live Linux CD. You can use it as a, a USB. You can use it as an installation onto your, onto your drive as well. It's based on the latest version of Ubuntu, currently based on what version are we on? We're running, we're running, <laughs> what year is it? Huh. We're running 904, 904 of Ubuntu. Now remember that Samurai, its main purpose is focusing on web penetration testing. There are some great live environments out there. We're not doing this to dish any of them. Look, I, look, I use Backtrack myself, right? 
What we're trying to do is find an environment strictly focused on the best web tools out there. We're, we're adding new ones every day. Uh, for example, in the version that we're releasing today, we've got uh, burn CDs, if anybody wants to grab us and, and grab a copy, uh, of 0 0.7. We've added a ton of new functionality. Jason Wood sent us uh, some files that actually parse Google searches to pull down LinkedIn profiles and generate lists of potential usernames using those search results, right? Robin from DigiNinja sent us the Google profile scans, been put into to Samurai. So all of these tools are pre-installed, ready to go, and they're, they're, you don't have to worry about making them work. Now, I will say, and, and you guys can laugh at anybody who writes me this email, because I do, the username and password to get into Samurai is really hard to figure out. It's Samurai. I say that because some idiot released Samurai 0 0.1 last year. Said idiot built a readme file that had the username and password, put the readme file on the desktop, built the ISO, and released it. <laughs> it took about 15 minutes, which I think was the download time, for somebody to send me the first email that said, how do I log in? <laughs> yes, I did reply, read the readme. <laughs> he did. Now, he really did. part of me wanted to say it was a test. You have physical access to the machine, and you're telling me you can't log in. You're not allowed to use it. So the next version had the README as a separate download. I got emails asking me what the username and password was. The next version had the README as a separate download and a wiki article telling you what the username and password was. And I got emails asking me what the username and password was. The last three versions, when you hit the GDM screen, it says the username and password is Samurai. I got an email last night asking me the username and password. Stop that. So Please. the new version is officially out. It is on our SourceForge site. You can download it there. We do have a limited number with us in our bags. We can hand them out after in the Q&A session in the separate room. By the way, the VMware image is not up on SourceForge yet because oh. Kevin lost his internet connection right before he got on a plane. And, well, I wasn't connecting to this network to upload it. <laughs> so when I get home Monday night, I'll start that upload. <laughs> and the tools that we did speak about today, Laudem and Yukoso are on the latest version with us or the yes. latest version that's online, that 0 0.7, which was uploaded, what, two, day, two nights ago? Well, unofficially, it was unofficially. uploaded, and, and I couldn't figure out how SourceForge's new interface throws me off, and I couldn't figure out how to hide the release, so it's actually been out for two days. And really briefly, just to give you guys an idea, future, future revisions, future ideas for Samurai, this is where we're headed. Currently, it is based on Ubuntu. We are going to be moving over to Kubuntu because we're selfish and we like KDE better than GNOME. Um, but don't fret, um, we are working on another solution for Ubuntu for those that, that do like GNOME. Part of that, we're also, with, towards the future, right now we're using Remaster Sys to build the CDs. We are moving over to the official uh, build process that Ubuntu is using, so that way we have a little bit better, a little bit better build process, a little bit better login, we can, we can have some of the same features that you currently have with right. KDE and Ubuntu. Um, and then finally, the last thing that we're, that we're really trying to plan on, and we're, we're trying to get this out the door, it's just very, very time consuming. Currently, all the software installed on Samurai is hand installed. So the way that we are maintaining the distribution is by passing ISOs back and forth. Um, Lots of fun. Yeah, it doesn't work very well with CVS or SVN. So um, all. we are moving to uh, moving all of our software, all of our configuration over to Debian packages. So that way, once you have Samurai, you'll be able to just do an update from 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. Or if you're shorthanded and you just need some, some new tools on there, you can go ahead and add anything else you want that we happen to have added at later, at later distributions. Um, which, which lets you add the Samurai tools and all of the other tools that are out there in packages to whatever environment that supports apt that you want. Right, so if you've got a system that you like, I don't know, backtrack, and you wanted to add a tool that we've got that they don't happen to have yet, 
You just pull it down with apt. Now, I do. I forgot to make one warning. Uh, this is the other email I get a lot of. Uh, on the desktop, when you boot into the environment, there is an install icon. That icon runs the Ubuntu installer to put it to your hard drive. And it gives you about 87,000 warnings that it's about to format your hard drive completely and you will lose all data on that drive. If you click that's okay over and over and over again and then write me complaining about the fact you lost all of your porn, <laughs> I'm going to laugh at you and then tell other people. <laughs> like here. So obviously our project links, laudum.ingardians.com, uh, yukoso.ingardians.com, and of course samurai.ingardians.com. Join one of the projects, please. We need all the help we can get. Uh, if you like the tools, and we think you will, please pass the word. Uh, they're pretty neat. We put a lot of work into them, a lot of heart and soul, and uh, we appreciate uh, any work we can get. Here's our contact information. Uh, if you want to, we're on Twitter. I'm still not sure why anybody would follow us, but people seem to. Uh, you can email us. We are, any questions you've got, please ask. We'll, put, we'll try to get you an answer, and if we can't, we'll figure it out. All right, do we have any questions? Wow. Cut, right in front. Right there. They cut you off. <laughs> Thank you.